testimony of some of our listeners who work in the NHS is that um, they're, they're pretty close to that now, if not already being overwhelmed. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We're hearing you know, great differences in people getting ambulances, and it's the, it's the risk to people with other conditions that, uh, because the NHS is under such stress, that people aren't able to get the care they need for other urgent conditions. Although it's really important that they do get to hospital and don't stay away because they're worried about COVID itself, as it were. Um, so it is very, very challenging indeed. But of course, it's, it's not an academic or even just a, a, a frivolous journalistic question. It is about uh, at what stage other measures might be required. And we're always told, aren't we, it's, it's a central plank of the government's policy that um, if the NHS is overwhelmed, then things have to change. And yet there's no there's no real definition of that. I mean, how would you define it? Well, of course, you see, the other challenge is that um, it, it, it's, it, there's a lag between people getting infected and ending up in hospital. So, you know, even if you slammed the brakes on now and had very strict on now, there would still be a rise in the number of admissions and cases over the next week or two. Um, and so, you know, in a quarter of a mile, a wagon is roundabout. Take the second exit onto the parkway, A312. You sort of have to anticipate being overwhelmed. You, you, yes, one has to anticipate. And that's been the case from the beginning. You know, a week or so from becoming symptomatic and infected to ending up in hospital, and then another week or so uh, before you end up in intensive care or worse, um, dying. Um, but, I mean, it is fairly clear that the Omicron variant is... Uh, less harmful in its effects, um, and that in large part is probably due to vaccination and people who've been infected previously, um, and probably a somewhat milder virus, but as we're seeing, it's still a not entirely benign disease, and of course what happens is that it tends to travel up the age groups, and so in London, as you heard from Chris Whitty and from Patrick Valance, it looks like the cases are plateauing in some cases reducing in young exit the roundabout onto the parkway continue on the parkway for one mile there's been you know, much more intergenerational mixing and we're seeing the numbers going up in people but there are still significant numbers of people who haven't been boosted we had nine million eligible people who haven't been boosted and so there's the potential for a lot more misery though hopefully uh, not a huge increase in deaths thank you professor professor sir mark walpole who was chief scientific advisor to the uk in a court in New York this afternoon, a judge listened to legal arguments from lawyers for Virginia Giuffray and lawyers for Prince Andrew. And having heard all of that, he said he would get back to them pretty soon. Let's hear more from Joe Pike from Sky News, who was in New York for all of this. Uh, Joe, what's your take on what happened in court? The hearing only lasted one hour and ten minutes, and as you say, the judge, Lewis Kaplan, ended by saying you will have a decision pretty soon. Now, he wouldn't define what pretty soon uh, meant. That in itself was a joke because the lawyers from either side spent the whole hearing arguing over their definitions of various words, various legal terms. In particular, the term in this 2009 settlement between the paedophile Jeffrey Epstein and Virginia Dupre, a secret document that was finally published yesterday. So she received in it $500,000 and Prince Andrew's lawyers argue that by doing so, she basically signed away the opportunity to take uh, Jeffrey Epstein's associates to court in civil proceedings in contrast to her own... In a quarter of a mile, at Cranford Parkway Interchange, take the second exit onto the M4 slip road to Heathrow Airport, M25. Now, the, uh, the way that the judge who was found interrogating the lawyers was interesting. He certainly seemed far more sceptical of the arguments made by the Duke of York's attorneys. He was interrupting uh, he was asking a lot of quite pointed questions. One of the uh, secondary arguments made by Andrew Brettler for the, the Duke of York was over uh, Virginia Dufresne not giving enough uh, detail in her accusations. He said that Ms. Dufresne needs to lock herself into a story now. She needs to allege uh, when he supposedly abused her. We don't even have a date, a time, or location. Exit the roundabout onto the slip road. With all due respect, Mr. Brettler. In a quarter of a mile, merge onto M4. Uh, the law. He also needs to make a decision whether, whether to dismiss this case or whether to continue. If he dismisses the case, it will be good for the Duke of York, but won't be a, uh, won't look necessarily brilliant because he won't have proved his innocence. He will instead have relied on this document effectively. Uh, so
saying you can't sue me because you settled with my, my paedophile friend. In contrast, if this does continue, if this case continues and it's not dismissed, we're likely to see uh, the process of discovery continue. That would likely include the deposition of uh, Prince Andrew, meaning he would be questioned by Virginia Dufresne's lawyers out of court uh, under the court house, and, and a transcript of that would be entered. We should say that uh, Prince Andrew has consistently and strenuously denied sexually assaulting Virginia Dufresne three times when she was 17 years old. And if the judge any, decides to go ahead uh, with this case, we could see a trial here in New York City in the autumn. Joe Pike, correspondent for Sky News, reporting live from New York. Peter Hunt is a royal commentator. Peter, what are your thoughts tonight? Well, I think it's that, that Prince Andrew will be desperately hoping that his lawyer has done enough, because, I mean, there are not many good options for Prince Andrew. The least worst for him is to succeed in stopping this uh, uh, case in its tracks so it doesn't proceed to trial. The next least worst, which again wouldn't necessarily look good in public opinion, would be for him to then try and settle, to reach an out-of-court of settlement with Virginia Giffray, which, of course, he's always denied wrongdoing. He's never accepted liability, and he wouldn't if he reached the settlement. But people would question more why if you insist you're innocent you don't want to have your day in court but that is the very worst option for him at any trial and him having a day in court even if everything goes entirely his way i wonder where this leaves him in in terms of his reputation well his reputation is very shredded and is being shredded every day and each day that passes he further damages the windsor brand and his reputation and its, its perilous state is captured by three photographs which will be with him to his dying day one is him with epstein in central park after he went to new york to break off his relationship with the convicted sex offender he said that he said he did that rather than rank him because he was an honorable person that is andrew saying he was an honorable person the second photograph is that one of andrew with his arm around the bare midriff of virginia Giffray, a teenager at the time uh, she clearly it has been a victim of sex trafficking in the same photograph as the child sex trafficker Maxwell taking the photograph is the sex offender Epstein. Epstein and Maxwell were friends of Andrew and then the third photograph is that photograph in the Maxwell trial Epstein and Maxwell uh, on holiday at Balmoral the Queen's uh, estate back in 1999. All of these are just some of the most recent examples of where his judgment has been lacking. We still see photographs, don't we, of Prince Andrew with the Queen, who is reportedly um, bankrolling this. Well, that's, that's the problem for the institution, because what the institution will want to do, and has done thus far in terms of the fact that he's, he's sort of left public life for the foreseeable future, is to sort of say, this is Andrew and it doesn't affect anybody else. But there are questions to be asked about the institution and the institution's judgment. I mean, for example, just going back to the Newsnight interview, why did they allow that to be filmed within the palace? Uh, why did they not just do it in an anonymous hotel? And the, Andrew is one of the Queen's weaknesses. Uh, she's in his uh, favourite... In a quarter of a mile, keep right to stay on M4. They are now paying the price of having indulged in for too long. And when it becomes to these sorts of issues of difficulty, she has often been likened to an ostrich where she has put her head in the sand and not confronted matters. And there are plenty of people in royal circles who said that Andrew is a problem that should have been confronted. Uh, keep right to stay on M4. Amelia has more news. The Prime Minister has announced around 100,000 key workers will be tested for the coronavirus every day. Boris Johnson hopes it will reduce the risk of people with the virus passing it on to their colleagues. The US judge will make a decision on whether to dismiss a civil lawsuit against Prince Andrew pretty soon. The Duke of York's lawyers are trying to get it thrown out based on a previous settlement between his accuser and Jeffrey Epstein. Sir Keir Starmer says he's not in favour of changing the law to decriminalise drugs following a trial in London. It's reported young people caught with cannabis in the capital could be offered a course of counselling instead of prosecution. LBC Business Updates with Direct Line Business Insurance. Cover for your business without breaking the bank. Downing Street says it doesn't think removing VAT from energy bills would necessarily cut costs for households facing big rises from April. It's currently only set at 5%, much lower than the tax on most other goods and services. LBC weather, wintry showers for northern and western areas tonight, a low of freezing. This is LBC. Booking a hotel can be a bit of a hassle. The fake reviews, the endless options, not to mention the fear of getting a bad deal. But with Premier Inn, you can cast all those worries aside because with us, you know exactly what you're getting. Like great value family rooms at over 800 locations, plenty of parking, and delicious food to please everyone, even the fussy ones. So you can family travel.
trip without any of the past. Premier Inn. Rest easy. Only available to book at premierin.com. You're a visionary, an entrepreneur, a passionate business owner, driven by results and poised for growth. You need opportunity. They easily match businesses of all sizes to winnable council, NHS and national government contracts. Just sign up, match with tenders and they'll help with the rest. Now is the time. Seize your opportunity. Get your free trial at opportunity.com. In a quarter of a mile, keep right to stay on M4. Enjoy an unforgettable experience with incredible service and warm hospitality. Flying to Australia from just £693 return. Book with flexibility today at SingaporeAirlines.com. Singapore Airlines. Keep right to stay on M4. Date exclusions in terms apply. If you want to lose weight, it's not about getting it right, but getting started. Healthy changes start with little changes, one way or another, and help you to feel better inside and out. So you'll be healthier and more able to fight diseases. Download the free NHS Weight Loss app. Better health. Let's do this. Calling all cabbies. You know the money you got for that fare? You've earned it. Hairdressers for those lovely highlights. Nice. You've earned it. For that. Oh, you've really earned it. So why give so much of your hard-earned money away every time you take a payment? LowPay is the instant payment app with no monthly fees and rates from 0.79%. That's less than half some charge. Download LowPay now and get a free terminal on us. You've earned it. See LowPay.com for T's and C's. And put some cream on that, mate. Eddie Mayor on LBC. 26 minutes to 6. To 7, I beg your pardon. Don't want to give you the wrong time. It's uh, 6.34. A 16-year-old boy has been charged with murder after another boy, also 16, died following a fatal stabbing. LBC's correspondent Matthew Thompson reports live. A 16-year-old boy has appeared in court at a charge with the murder of another boy of the same age who was London's record 30th teenage homicide last year. The victim, who was named by police as Yonat Elvis Taku, died of stab wounds following the attack at Philpott's Farm open space which is close to Heather Lane in Hillingdon, West London. Shortly after half past seven on Thursday, ambulance paramedics arrived uh, at the scene. The teenager was sadly pronounced dead uh, just after 8.20 p.m. The Metropolitan Police said a post-mortem that took place on Sunday found the cause of death was stab wounds. And the suspect appeared at Ealing Youth Court today, was remanded in custody to appear again at the Old Bailey on Thursday. He can't be named, of course, because of his age. And the teenager's death in Hillingdon came less than an hour after 15-year-old Zane A. Mevaldina was fatally stabbed in Croydon in South London. And those two murders took the total number of teenage deaths, or murders in the capital, I should say, uh, in 2021 to 30, which passed the previous peak of 29, set way back in 2008. Uh, a 15-year-old boy was charged with Zane's murder and appeared at Bromley Magistrates Court this afternoon. He spoke only to confirm his name, age, date of birth again, um, in two miles, at Junction 6, take the A355 exit to Slough Central. Matthew Thompson reporting. It's been called the trial that shook Silicon Valley. A businesswoman, Elizabeth Holmes, who founded a company that tested people's blood, has been convicted by a jury of defrauding investors. Prosecutors argued that Elizabeth Holmes knowingly lied about technology she claimed could detect diseases with just a few drops of blood. Charles Arthur is a technology journalist, was tech editor at The Guardian. He's also author of Social Warming, The Dangerous and Polarizing Effects of Social Media. Charles, welcome. How are you? I'm good, I think. Um, uh, my ignorance generally knows no bounds, so I apologize for this horrible truth. Until today, I was unaware of Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, you know all about her. Uh, who is she? She is a, uh, well, she was a self-made billionaire for a while, uh, because Theranos, uh, which she started in 2003, she dropped out of university um, uh, in 2003, not about the same sort of time that Mark Zuckerberg was dropping out of, uh, out of his course to start Facebook. Uh, 
So they started their companies at roughly the same time. She was on the East Coast, he was on the West Coast. Um, and her big idea was that you could take a few drops of blood from someone and that you'd be able to do all sorts of diagnoses from that of disease, uh, all sorts of the, you know, characteristics about people, were they getting cancer, um, you know, how was their blood sugar doing, all, the, all these sorts of things. She hoped that you could do 200 sorts of uh, different tests from it. In fact, uh, the machines that she was uh, dreaming of that uh, were being built by this company could only do 12 tests, and most of those were being done by standard equipment that already existed. So the uh, convictions that she received were for some of the larger amounts that she was able to persuade investors to uh, give her. Um, and In a quarter of a mile, at Junction 6, take the A355 exit to Slough Central. Managed to persuade some very rich people to part with a great deal of money. She did. It was in the tens of, or even hundreds of millions. So yes, it was incredibly well funded. And the argument um, that was all when we exit at Junction Six. You know, doing things with biology is much harder than you know, stuff like Facebook was doing, which is basically uh, build lots of web pages and, uh, and tweak them. In a quarter of a mile at the roundabout, take the third exit onto Tuns Lane A three five five front-loading thing where eventually it will pay off but the reality was that they never got close to it and uh, there was a whistleblower inside the company you could see the deception that was going on and who eventually told a Wall Street Journal reporter about what was going on he stood the story up and uh, despite Theron's and Holmes's denials um, eventually the company ran into the ground and closed up shop in 2018 and she is likely to go to prison for a long time Yes, on the uh, on, on the counts on which she was found guilty, because she was found not guilty on a number of others. There were somewhere investors were felt to not have taken enough care about um, inquiring about the uh, the bona fides, and others where patients had uh, sued Theranos, and those she was found not guilty on as much as anything, because the relationship between her uh, Theranos and the patients wasn't very clear. Often there were sort of health insurance companies in the way. Um, but yes, on these ones of deceiving these investors. Um, it could be up to 20 years, though it's likely that it would be less than that. And why is this seen as, I mean, it's obviously a, a shocking story in and of itself, but what are the... Exit the roundabout onto Tuns Lane. Well, the way that it's being dressed up is that uh, this means that the thing of fake it until you make it in Silicon Valley of sort of, you know, just keep on trying and it's just around the corner, just keep on pivoting, as they say, change your business model, change what you're trying to do, uh, eventually you'll, uh, you'll start to make it. Uh, to some extent that does go on a great deal in Silicon Valley, but also a lot of it is not done. In a quarter of a mile, slight left towards Sippenham Lane. You just can't fool biology, you can't... Um, you know, you can't change the laws of biology in that sense. Uh, whereas if you're doing things around cryptocurrency or other things like that, well, actually, yes, you can keep on pivoting and saying, well, we, we were going to be doing this and now we're doing that and, and keep on stringing people endlessly along. And it's a lot easier to do things which are just software where you can just change it um, from minute to minute. And uh, So in that sense, I'm not so sure that Silicon Valley actually is going to uh, stop investing in things that will eventually go bust or possibly make some money. Slight out. left towards Sip in lane. Because there's a lot of money sloshing around out there looking for things to invest in because interest rates are so bad at the moment. Charles, thank you. Charles Arthur, technology journalist, author of Social Warming, The Dangerous and Polarizing Effects of Social Media. In 1967, long before... Continue for one and a half miles. Census Act legalized homosexual acts between men aged 21 or over in England in England and Wales, I should say, provided those acts were consensual and in private. Similar legislation was passed in Scotland in 1980 and in Northern Ireland in 1982. Times have changed, but there are still people who carry convictions on their record for same-sex sexual activity. The Home Secretary says more people will now be eligible for a pardon for historical criminal convictions relating to same-sex activity, so that anyone convicted or cautioned under laws which are now abolished can apply to have them disregarded. Lord Cashman, Michael Cashman, is a Labour peer who's been campaigning for this amendment. Uh, what's it like to achieve this? 
Well, Eddie, it, it's um, it's remarkable. We've I've been working on this with Lord Lexton, a Conservative backbench peer, and Professor Paul Johnson of York for nearly seven years. But of course, the work, as you rightly say, stretches back a long, long time because. Well, first of all, we've got to get the measures through the House of Lords, which I believe we will get support for and get support in the Commons. But in 1967, when the uh, consenting acts between men over 21 were partially decriminalised, after that, we actually saw a huge number of increased arrests of gay and bisexual men for the very crimes, in inverted commas, that we're now asking for the pardons to be extended to. People were arrested uh, for simply chatting somebody up in Earl's Court, the bars I used to go to in the 60s and 70s. There were what was known as pretty policemen who were outside dressed in t-shirts and jeans urging you to approach them and immediately you, you could be arrested uh, for soliciting for an immoral purpose, uh, procuring, and there were very various other convictions and cautions. So it's a real step forward that we're widening the pardons and the disregards so that the convictions are wiped, they're both posthumous and for the living, but, but equally we are now widening them throughout the armed forces, going back to something like 1550, because in the armed forces, after uh, the partial decriminalization, uh, servicemen uh, were arrested, went to prison for activity that outside in civilian life would not have been criminalized, and then they were kicked out of the service uh, uh, under the, uh, the, the topic of dis disgraceful conduct uh, and conduct uh, no longer uh, no longer befitting an officer or a, a, a member of the forces. So once they served their sentence, they then were prohibited from finding gainful employment uh, that was within the armed services. And in civilian life, equally, once a conviction rested on somebody's record, that prevented them from a whole range of employments uh, that necessitated detailed background checks. So today is a brilliant opportunity, I hope, to get rid of the culture, culture wars that some have been stoking up and look at the discrimination that has been going on for centuries that still needs to be addressed and the wider discrimination that minorities in our country still face, including trans women, trans men, and trans teenagers. It's a very important day, but so long as we build on it and we're not complacent. And for those